Well, welcome. My name is Danielle Harvey and I am a realtor with Coldwell Banker and I am sitting down today with Susie Germany with a Germany law firm and we are going to talk about the probate process as it pertains to real estate today. Um, so Susie, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Susie Germany. I'm a probate elder law and estate planning attorney and I've been practicing for about 20 years and I'm licensed in Colorado, Wyoming and Alaska. So today we're going to talk briefly about the probate process um, and I'm going to interview Susie here. She has a wealth of knowledge about this process. Um, so I'm super excited to dive in. If you have any further questions, our contact information is below. So um, please feel free to reach out to us. We would love to help you out. So um, Susie, I wanted to talk to you today about probate. Um, so why don't we define that really quick? What is probate and what is its purpose? Sure, so probate is the process whereby the, the ownership of assets transfer from a person who has passed away to the people that are designated to receive whatever items that person owned during their life. Okay, and um, in, in my opinion, there's three pretty common scenarios that play out in the probate court. Um, the first scenario would be maybe when a person actually is still alive, but they become incapacitated for one reason or another, whether it's an injury or um, dementia, Alzheimer's, and um, they need to move to like, for example, a long-term care setting, but they need to sell the home. Um, and then there's a couple other scenarios that there is a will, it's very defined, it's very clear. And then there is one where perhaps it was like an unexpected expected um, death or the person wasn't maybe perhaps the most organized person and didn't have a will. Um, and so I wanted to talk about those three scenarios. If you wouldn't mind, let's start with um, a scenario where a person is still alive and they must go through the probate process to get the authority to assist an individual in, in moving on to the next phase of life. Sure. So a lot of times people think the probate court is just pertaining to people who have, who have died. Um, and that in fact is not the case. And so if someone has been deemed to be incapacitated and cannot make their health care and wealth, welfare decisions, they might need to be appointed a guardian. And the person who manages their assets in Colorado that would, might be appointed is called a conservator. Mm -hmm. So there might be a situation where a guardian and or a conservator might be appointed for someone. Mm -hmm. And if that person requires long-term care, it might be necessary for them to sell the home in order to pay for that care mm -hmm. um, or do other planning for them. So um, if there is a conservator, then they have to seek court authority mm -hmm. in order to sell that home. Okay, great. Can you talk through briefly a scenario where a loved one passes away and there's a very clear will, everybody knows about it, nobody's making a fuss about it or anything like that. How does that scenario typically play out in court? Sure, so when there's an uncontested probate mm -hmm. um, where there is a will in existence mm -hmm. or some kind of estate planning documents, um, it definitely makes the process much, much smoother, it makes it faster, and it makes mm -hmm. it l much less expensive. Mm -hmm. and definitely less stressful for families. Um, so we always encourage our clients when they're doing their estate planning, mm -hmm. if it if it's possible for them to have a conversation with their family so that there are a few surprises and people know where things are located, mm -hmm. they know where the documents are located, mm -hmm. and they can make that process as smooth as possible. Now the last scenario is perhaps maybe it was an unexpected death or the family is not getting along and they're contesting the will. Um, so can you talk about that scenario and how that typically plays out? Yeah, so you have different scenarios where sometimes people will have a will and no one knew about it mm -hmm. or it will be a will that they did on their own mm -hmm. um, and it may have some things that are defective about it and that can create a whole lot of litigation in the courts and it can also be complicated when someone dies without a will or mm -hmm. without anything at all in place. Mm -hmm. And in that scenario, definitely the process is more expensive. It's more mm -hmm. time consuming. And it, the, the biggest problem is the people who are receiving mm -hmm. from the estate may not be the people that the person who died ever intended to give anything to. Mm -hmm. um, because there's a formula under state law that yeah. says who inherits automatically when someone dies mm -hmm. if they don't have a will or don't have any other estate planning in place, like a trust. Okay. Yeah. When um, 
a family member um, you know, comes across a situation, where do you advise them to just start if they have no idea what's going on? Sure. So if that family member, I mean, I guess it depends what mm -hmm. information they have available to okay. them. If they've seen a copy of a will, if they have a copy mm -hmm. of any documentation, um, that that's obviously the place to start. And they mm -hmm. should retain counsel to assist them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have family members that will contact us and say, hey, I know my dad died. Mm -hmm. I never heard anything about it. I don't mm -hmm. know if an estate was ever opened. And we can usually do some investigation to mm -hmm. see if a court case was ever opened and if no one has ever stepped forward mm -hmm. depending on that person's relationship to the person who died mm -hmm. they may or may not have statutory priority to step forward to become a personal mm -hmm. representative if there needs to be a probate okay um what would you say is, is there ever a scenario where you would say, you know, you can just go to the self-help desk and download the forms and go about this on your own? Or would you advise that people always, you know, seek counsel? You know, that's a really tough question. Mm -hmm. um, every single situation is mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even things that seem very straightforward mm -hmm. and seem like people could do themselves turn mm -hmm. out to be a lot more complicated. Yeah. So people do sometimes mm -hmm. seek out the self-help self help mm -hmm. forms online um, through the court system to mm -hmm. open a probate. And mm -hmm. sometimes they're able to mm -hmm. successfully do that. Um, but what I would say is there's a lot of things mm -hmm. to know about probate yeah. and sometimes people get part way into mm -hmm. the process and they realize, oh my gosh, I didn't know I needed to have an accountant mm -hmm. and I didn't know yeah. I needed to file taxes mm -hmm. or I have some tax issues that need to be addressed. Yeah. So I would say it is possible mm -hmm. for people to do it themselves. It mm -hmm. might not always be the best thing though. Okay. I think one of the big hangups is always going to be cost. How do people um, pay for an attorney for their loved one's estate? So typically the attorney's fees for an estate mm -hmm. administration are payable from the estate okay. itself if there are funds available. Um, sometimes family and members might end up having mm -hmm. to front some costs and getting reimbursed mm -hmm. back from the estate mm -hmm. once the estate is opened. Mm -hmm. And the way fees are charged really changes um, based on what state you're located in. Mm -hmm. In some states, um, legal fees can be charged on a percentage basis mm -hmm. and in other states are charged on an hourly basis. Well, great. So going back to the court process just a little bit, how is a conservator or personal representative established when, especially when there's, you know, assets involved and, um, a, you know, a, a loved one and a, an adult child or something is realizing, okay, we, I have got to sell the car, I've got to sell the house, I've got to sell all these big assets in order to make this move possible. Um, you know, how are those people selected? Um, especially in like a, in a contested type scenario. Right. Um, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. So, um, basically state law lays mm -hmm. out who, what family members, yeah. um, or, you know, folks in people's mm -hmm. lives have statutory priority mm -hmm. to either become their guardian or their mm -hmm. conservator. Mm -hmm. Um, same thing kind of applies mm -hmm. with a personal representative for someone who's passed. Mm -hmm. So if there is a will mm -hmm. in place or, or a trust that names someone mm -hmm. with specific authority, mm -hmm. then they are going to have priority to mm -hmm. serve, um, mm -hmm. as long as they, they are acting in the best interest of that person or the estate. Mm -hmm. um, if there is a situation, however, where there is no will, there is nothing mm -hmm. in writing, um, then that's a different situation. Yeah. It could be that uh, that formula I talked about mm -hmm. where people have certain priorities to step forward. Mm -hmm. I can tell you though pretty accurately that mm -hmm. if there is a contested situation mm -hmm. either over guardianship and conservatorship mm -hmm. or over the appointment of a personal mm -hmm. representative, oftentimes a professional is mm -hmm. chosen to serve in mm -hmm. those roles versus a family member. Mm -hmm. Just because you know if the court chooses one family mo member over another, mm -hmm that can just create ongoing fighting. So that, that seems to be pretty common. Great. And now at what point in the process can an individual who like receives that authority from the court, the, the personal representative or the conservator, start liquidating the assets? At what, what point of the process is that? 
So once mm -hmm. a personal representative is appointed, um, what what the statutes mm -hmm. say is that that person's first job is to locate and inventory mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. that there is in the in the mm -hmm. estate. And once they've done that, and once, mm -hmm. of course, they've given notice to everyone who that they're supposed to, that they've mm -hmm. been appointed, then they are in a position where if they need to, say, sell a mm -hmm. house or liquidate mm -hmm. an asset, they can do so. Mm -hmm. Now, the one qualifier I would say is if it's a contested situation mm -hmm. or the court's been highly involved, mm -hmm. there might be some restrictions on that sale, and they mm -hmm. may need to get specific authority before they sell assets mm -hmm. um, and in a conservatorship definitely mm -hmm. with a person there being a conservator for someone who's still alive mm -hmm. they need to get court authority even before selling a car yeah yeah um, what what are those letters called so for a personal representative mm -hmm. and there is a will in place mm -hmm. it's called letters testamentary mm -hmm. and if there's a personal representative mm -hmm. and there is no will in place it's called letters of administration mm -hmm. so they all kind of have different mm -hmm. names depending on the situation mm -hmm. so let's um, kind of fast forward to the point where a home is you know was on the market they accepted an offer um, and that they get to closing. How is that property conveyed then? Um, is it like a normal property, like if you and I were to go purchase a home, or is it is it unique in some way? It is unique. Mm -hmm. um, there is a document called a personal representative's mm -hmm. deed, and mm -hmm. the only person that can sign that deed mm -hmm. is a court-appointed personal representative. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes people even mm -hmm. get as far as listing yeah. a house for sale, mm -hmm. they're getting ready for closing, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the title company discovers, well, the mm -hmm. person who's doing this really has no court authority. Yeah. They were never appointed by the court to actually mm -hmm. sell that home or convey mm -hmm. that home. So the personal representative's deed mm -hmm. is something that is neat, you know, it does have to be prepared by an attorney mm -hmm. and that is necessary for closing mm -hmm. and for you know conveying a property that mm -hmm. is in an estate. So that's a really important comment too is that title companies do not prepare those deeds like they do in other scenarios and so you know engaging the right people engaging the right counsel from the get-go is vital like you said so it is it is mm -hmm. and there's also mm -hmm. a tax letter that also yeah. has to be provided when you're selling an estate mm -hmm. property mm -hmm. where there has to be an opinion by legal counsel that mm -hmm. the estate does not owe any estate tax and yeah. is not a taxable estate mm -hmm. or if it is then we have to disclose that as well so mm -hmm. that's the other piece of a closing for an estate mm -hmm. property that's somewhat unique so say you're, you know, the loved one has passed, the house has gotten cleared out, and the home is getting ready to list, or it's currently on the market. What do you advise people to do to maintain that property? What is the what is the best thing to do to, you know, maintain that big asset? Sure. Mm -hmm. So of course the most mm -hmm. important thing is to keep it insured yes. and make sure the insurance doesn't mm -hmm. lapse, and also making mm -hmm. sure that the home is secured, locks are changed, mm -hmm. that only people who should have access do have access. Mm -hmm. Also making the house look lived in and yeah. making sure someone's visiting it frequently mm -hmm. because unfortunately mm -hmm. vacant homes are often a target for crime yes. mm -hmm. and so making sure that you know those things mm -hmm. are being taken care of the utilities are being paid mm -hmm. so there's no frozen pipes in the winter yeah. or things like that that can happen landscaping is keeping up right. all that stuff exactly um great what what would you advise um you know somebody who's thinking about um you know, the future of when they, you know, how to set up their estate um, and making it the easiest um, possible process for their adult children someday. What do you typically advise for people to do? You know, depending on someone's mm -hmm. assets, mm -hmm. it might make a lot of sense to do trust planning. Mm -hmm. um, trust planning alleviates mm -hmm. a lot of the need for the court mm -hmm. probate process. Yeah. And not everyone necessarily is mm -hmm. a good fit for a trust, yeah. but a lot of people are. And mm -hmm. um, handling real estate through a trust mm -hmm. can often be a little bit easier, especially mm -hmm. in the event of incapacity mm -hmm. um, or, you know, through an estate mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. Um, and having to sell mm -hmm. after someone has passed, but mm -hmm. it can make things, I think, a little more efficient. Great. What common mistakes do you see people doing um, that they, they, they think that they're protecting their children by perhaps like putting them on the deed of the home? Um, do you see scenarios like that that really kind of backfire? I do, especially mm -hmm. today when mm -hmm. our our 
you know, values of our mm -hmm. homes have gone up mm -hmm. so much yeah. and people will just add their children to the title of mm -hmm. their home mm -hmm. thinking that that's a cheap mm -hmm. way of doing estate yeah. planning. But what they don't realize is that this may actually penalize their children mm -hmm. later when their children go to resell that house someday mm -hmm. because they're not going to realize the tax benefits mm -hmm. that you do when you receive a home, mm -hmm. a piece of real estate through either the probate process mm -hmm. or through a trust, mm -hmm. um, you don't get that same benefit than if you do, if it's a lifetime gift yeah. where you're just added on the deed and then you go to resell. Mm -hmm. So it could actually penalize their children quite a bit tax wise later on. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a penny wise, pound foolish type of you yeah. know thing that people just don't often mm. realize. So Susie, from an attorney's perspective, um, what qualities or questions might you advise your clients to ask when they are seeking out a realtor to sell their loved one's home? Sure. Um, mm -hmm. I, the main qualities I see that realtors mm -hmm. who are dealing with probate should have is yeah. an understanding mm -hmm. of, first of all, the family dynamics yes. of understanding mm -hmm. what grieving people are going through mm -hmm. and how that can manifest itself. Because realtors often will take the brunt of that yeah. and feel caught in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important for the realtor mm -hmm. to know what their role is and mm -hmm. who the person is that is their client. Yeah and who they are representing mm -hmm. in that transaction mm -hmm. because a lot of times different family members will want to insert themselves. Yes. So I think having experience mm -hmm. and understanding what the legal authority is mm -hmm. and what it means mm -hmm. for the person they're representing, mm -hmm. also understanding the nature of the property that they're mm -hmm. selling yeah. and also understanding the market and, yeah. and also realizing that the personal representative mm -hmm. is under an obligation to maximize mm -hmm. the value of yes. the estate. So they have to sell that for the maximum mm -hmm. amount possible, mm -hmm. you know, within reason. Mm -hmm. The other th thing that's really important is for a realtor who documents mm -hmm. well, yeah. because oftentimes if we are dealing with a probate mm -hmm. where we know the personal representative is going to have to lower the price significantly, yeah. and we know there's going to be unhappy beneficiaries mm -hmm. of that estate, we want the realtor to be able mm -hmm. to document the reasons why for mm -hmm. the decrease in that mm -hmm. property value. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we might even want to get a court order yeah. to validate that, that realtor's opinion. Mm -hmm. And so the realtor is a really key mm -hmm. component to the probate mm -hmm. process, especially mm -hmm. when we're talking about families and yeah. folks that might not agree mm -hmm. on things like the value of the property, yeah. because mm -hmm. a lot of times families think that the property is mm -hmm. worth a lot more money yeah. than it really is. Mm -hmm. And you get to be the bearer of bad news as the realtor. Yeah. Um, I think the other qualities that are important is mm -hmm. understanding the timelines yes. and also understanding Understanding, you know, there may be reporting requirements mm -hmm. that the personal representative or their counsel have to the mm -hmm. court. Yeah. Um, these are unique situations. Mm -hmm. um, I would say selling an estate property is not a run-of-the-mill experience. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, for a realtor who's working with someone who is a guardian or a conservator mm -hmm. for someone yeah. and knows that this person mm -hmm. is still living in the home and is going to have to move, mm -hmm. has an understanding of what that transition process mm -hmm. looks like, how difficult it is. Yeah timelines, mm -hmm. um, and all of those facets, and also is on the lookout for fraud yeah. and, and is keyed in to, again, who has real authority to mm -hmm. make certain decisions, mm -hmm. sign documents, mm -hmm. et cetera, mm -hmm. and that there aren't things going on that shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Are there any red flags that you see in a scenario like that with, you know, a realtor, you know, maybe somebody decided to hire the family friend and they've been a realtor for years. Are there any red flags that you see throughout the process of maybe perhaps the realtor's not asking you the right questions or asking the family the right questions? Um, Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I would say the mm -hmm. number one red flag that I've seen mm -hmm. is realtors that want mom or dad to sign yeah. the listing agreement mm -hmm. and they're under a guardianship or in conservatorship yeah. and they don't even understand the you know, mm -hmm. why mom and dad are under a guardianship mm -hmm. or conservatorship, or they are the family friend and mm -hmm. they're listening to their friend yeah. instead of listening to the personal representative mm -hmm. of the estate or mm -hmm. listening to the, the conservator mm -hmm. as to the value or the condition of the mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. And that will often, believe mm -hmm. it or not, create a lot of litigation. Mm -hmm. it, the, the, the choice of realtor oftentimes mm -hmm. is one of the biggest hot button issues in, mm -hmm. in a probate 
subject matter. Yeah. Um, and that can be the cause for thousands of dollars of litigation mm -hmm. in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So we always try to recommend folks that mm -hmm. we know are experienced mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. probate area mm -hmm. and often are neutral to the yeah. situation just mm -hmm. to avoid any, mm -hmm. you know, allegations by different parties. Mm -hmm. I think someone like you yeah. is extremely important in mm -hmm. to have in cases Mm -hmm. where there's a probate mm -hmm. because of your background yeah. in adult protection yeah. and your understanding of mm -hmm. at-risk adults yeah. and making sure that they are protected mm -hmm. through a process like this and mm -hmm. that also you have the legal background in working mm -hmm. in the court process to understand mm -hmm. what legal documents people mm -hmm. need to have in place in mm -hmm. order to sell a property um, mm -hmm. that may be subject to the probate court mm -hmm. or to the probate process. And mm -hmm. so I think that's extremely important. Yeah. Well, great, Susie. Thanks for sitting down with me and kind of talking through, you know, bird's eye view what the probate process looks like in common scenarios. How might somebody get in touch with you if they are they live here in Colorado and they are going through this exact scenario right now? Sure. Well, they can always contact mm -hmm. us online mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. our website, the Germany Law Firm. They can also mm -hmm. call our office, obviously, um, mm -hmm. and they're always welcome to set up an appointment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we frequently run mm -hmm. through a lot of these yeah. things in our initial consultation with folks. Great, great. It is much more of an in-depth process, so I think we've only touched on you know, bits and pieces of it today, but I would totally advise somebody to really get some further information um, from an attorney just such as yourself. So thanks so much for meeting with me today and kind of talking through that process is really helpful. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Okay.